Hello, this is a let's play of the first room of the first level of Half-Life 1. And as you can see here, the very first view you have, this doorway kind of is of the airlock is framing your view of the lobby. And the lobby consists of this desk, this reception desk, and the map and the name of the place where you are, which is Black Mesa Research Facility. Um, doorways are really good for framing a player's view, especially since we actually don't have much control over which way the player's looking, right? What if during that whole sequence where the doorway was opening, the player was like looking this way, right? I don't know, they could have been, who knows? But doorways are pretty unique in that they kind of take advantage of the tendency of players to move in the direction, to look in the direction where they're moving. So most players are probably gonna just gonna walk forward. It's the path of least resistance, I guess. Um, so I wanna kind of wanna contrast framing a view with controlling a view. Um, over here you can see there's a button. If we push it, um, this like screen pops up. And um, this guy yells at you for doing that and he pushes the button to close and undo the button push you did. And notice that when we push the button, we are looking in this direction and we don't see the NPC from behind us approach us. So actually that's kind of really powerful. We can make a lot of assumptions from that and we can actually use that to surprise the player. Um, Valve uses that to surprise the player again with this button when you push it here. When you're looking here and you push the button here, you don't see this light fixture at first. Um, you only notice it when it turns on. And again, that there's, that there's another notion of like surprise there. And thematically, these two buttons, which are the, like, the very first two interactions you can possibly have in this game, um, these two buttons kind of thematically set up this motif where you push a button and shit happens. Basically, you fuck up by pushing this button. It's unforeseen consequences. It's you literally can't see the consequence happening behind you or off, or off the frame or something. Um, another thing I want to point out is this. Um, this is a guy sitting in a chair and the chair rotates with him. Um, the chair is actually a door and as far as the uh, Half-Life computer code or engine is concerned, um, the door and the guy are two separate things. Um, the door or the chair door or whatever is just programmed to rotate maybe five, for five seconds it rotates one way and then one second it rotates the other way to correspond with the animation of the guy sitting and turning in midair. Um, I want to explain that because that kind of explains the technical constraints behind all this. Um, which is to say that because these two things are perfectly synchronized, like he will never move out of the chair. He will never get up from the chair. He will never stop in the chair and look at you, right? Notice he's kind of locked into this loop. And that actually limits a lot of what you can do with narrative and aesthetically wise, right? Like he can't do a lot and that's kind of constraint of technology back from 1998, back from a Quake engine lineage. Um, now let's leave this lobby and then kind of go down this corridor and go here. It's another atrium. Um, why is this corridor here? Um, there could be a lot of reasons why this corridor here. Um, one of the ones I want to propose, perhaps, is that the corridor is here so that it can control how much, how many polygons you're seeing. Um, if we actually disable collision and fly out here, we can see what this corridor is actually doing, right? It's isolating this lobby from this atrium right here. It's cutting off visibility between the two. So that when you're in this lobby, there's this giant wall in the way, you can't see anything but you can still get to it by turning around 
and walking around and going here. Um, in level design, we call this pattern maybe like a donut hole um, or like a torus or something. Um, now, there's a good chance the technical uh, constraint kind of guided where how this level was structured, but you can see kind of the level designer did did the best they could with what that was. Like um, what I want to point your attention to over here is this right here, where the concrete joins this kind of greenish turquoise wall. Um, the way this concrete ceiling sits on this curved corner right here, I think is just really beautiful. It's really sculptural in a way, because they could have easily just had this concrete join um, the wall in kind of like an oblique, kind of like butt joint, and that would have been really unartful, but functionally the same. Um, but they made a really concerted effort to extend the ceiling, actually, to kind of encompass this corner so that it's sitting on the corner. And it kind of gives this whole kind of facility like a sense of place, like there's a weight to it. This concrete is sitting on this wall and there's support and load being carried here. Um, this is kind of like a detail that I want to contrast with these, these other details right here. Here you see in a whole uh, a light bank, an array of lights on the ceiling, one of them is off. And same thing here, one of them is off. And the kind of mentality there is that um, real world places aren't perfect. So if all of these light fixtures were on, it would seem too perfect, too virtual. Um, if you turn off one of them or make it one of them flickering, or something you add kind of imperfections, maybe subtle shadowing or something. And also the implication kind of is that there's a uh, kind of materiality to it that, you know, virtual lights can actually burnt out and that's what creates a sense of place. Um, I don't really believe that kind of argument anymore. I think that's kind of poisonous actually. Um, I want to contrast these two kinds of details. This kind of detail where it's kind of really elegant and sculptural and this kind of detail which is just kind of busy work that they could have made an intern do you know go through all the levels and turn off one light randomly and this kind of mentality is just really I think it's infected the AAA game industry and level design within the game industry like as a whole because that's what they've conflated realism and presence and being in a world is like you know, they think uh, realism in a world is more details, you know, piling on more stuff. This is quantifiable. This is quantifiably more work than this. You know, maybe this took the level designer two seconds, or maybe it took them an hour to suddenly think they could put this concrete block on top of this wall. But I'm arguing this is more believable. This is a really believable detail. This is really beautiful, and it's it's so much more present. It communicates so much more um, worldness than turning off one random light fixture in a light bank ever could. And I, I just want to emphasize how we see these kind of, kind of the birth of these two different competing ideologies here about what realism actually means in uh, virtual architecture, uh, especially game design. And in case you ever thought you could never read too much into a video game, I've just proven you wrong, hopefully. Um, thanks for listening and watching. Bye.